Good morning, Fellowship Greenville. <laughs> it's good to be back. Uh, Karen and I have been away for a few weeks on uh, sabbatical down in Florida for the uh, birth of our newest uh, grandbaby, uh, Aniston Grace Miller, and a uh, beautiful little girl, and she makes number eight for us. Then we came home to regroup and then back to a different part of Florida for a big uh, family vacation, and that was a great time of uh, memory making as well. Then back to regroup again, and then the, just the two of us, we had our anniversary on July the 23rd, but we were driving back from Florida, but uh, the two of us got off to a cabin in the backwoods of LJ, Georgia, up near Blue Ridge, and that was glorious. It was a much needed time of rest and refreshment from all the other things that we have done, if you catch my drift there. But anyway, I'm glad to be back, and today we're continuing our series uh, on the attributes of God that we've entitled, Here Is Your God. And just to refresh your memory, we're doing this series because we live in a world today where there are a lot of distorted images of God, a lot of distorted ideas about what God is like that are not true to how God has revealed himself to us in Scripture. And the biggest distortion in our culture today is that many people, if they believe in God at all, many people want to design their own God. And we've talked about that throughout this series. Many people want to fashion a God who's like them, uh, who uh, is okay with what they do, no questions asked, to create a God in their own image. But when you create your own idea of God, that's nothing more than an idol, not all that different than the idols that ancient people fashioned out of uh, wood and metal and stone. And so we've been digging into scripture, asking the question, what is God really like? And we've talked about how God, first of all, is not like us, how he's holy, how he's sovereign, uh, the sovereign creator over all things, how he's gracious and loving and faithful. And today we're going to look at what is undoubtedly the least popular attribute of God, at least in our culture, and that is how God is just, how God is our judge, how God, yes, he is loving, merciful, compassionate, but he's also a God of wrath. Now, in talking about this particular attribute, I would say there are at least four common distortions, four common misconceptions that people have about God being a God of justice and judgment. <clears throat> Number one is this picture of God having his finger just above the red button, and he knows if you've been bad or good, and so be good for goodness sake. But he knows if you've been bad or good, and he's ready to zap you with negative consequences the moment you step out of line. And if this is your idea of God, then your picture of God will shape how you interpret the events of your life. Like when, when something good happens to you, you think God is rewarding you. When something bad happens to you, you think God is punishing you. Now, number two misconception is uh, just the opposite of that. And it's like, no, 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 no. God, God is not like that at all. It, if, if God is a God of judgment, he cannot be a God of, of love. The two just do not mix. So God is a God of love, period. He's our buddy. He may not always be happy with everything going on in our world today, but he's not really angry with anyone. He just wants us to try harder, to do better, to keep the 10 suggestions. And then... Um, you caught that, did you? Yeah. Number three misconception is related to number two, but it's specific to Christianity. And it's the person who says that the Old Testament is a book about a judging God, a God of wrath, and the New Testament is about a God of love. And someone that holds this view will typically say, I don't like the Old Testament God. I like the New Testament God because he's loving and compassionate and merciful and he tells us to love others and, uh, and, to, and, and help our neighbors and all that stuff. It's a very common, very common view in many churches today. And the fourth misconception is the opposite of number three. And that is the idea that the whole Bible is about a God of wrath. That is his predominant attribute. And it's about how God is angry with the people he created. And at Judgment Day, everybody's going to get what's coming to him. So how do you make sense of all this? 
I mean, how can God be a God of justice and a God of mercy at the same time? And that's the question that we're going to uh, unpack and answer this morning. And we're just going to let the Bible speak for itself on this topic. Because what you need to see is that the Bible insists that not only is God a God of both uh, love and judgment, but, but those two attributes actually establish each other. In other words, one without the other is nonsense. One without the other is meaningless. If you try to somehow remove judgment and wrath from the Christian gospel, you have no gospel at all. And you gotta understand that God's justice and God's love go together. In fact, scripture tells us in no uncertain terms that these two attributes of God are not in com conflict with each other. They complement one another because they're both rooted in the same source. They're rooted in the goodness of God. And God is a judge because he's good and he's gonna put an end to evil in this world. And God's good because he's a savior and he saves us from the judgment that's coming. And so today we're gonna focus on one Old Testament passage of scripture and two New Testament passages of scripture that you probably read this week if you're doing our uh, community Bible reading plan with us. So I wanna show you that the Bible is consistent, Old Testament and New Testament, in what it reveals to us about the nature of God. So you up for this? This is a little dense, it's a little thick. We're gonna have to dive in and uh, put our, uh, our thinking caps on. So take your Bible, paper, digital, turn to Exodus 34. Exodus 34 is the longest, most dense and detailed description of God's character in the Old Testament, really in the whole Bible. It, it has the most descriptions of who God is packed into just a couple of lines right here in Exodus 34, six and seven. And, and this passage is repeated over 20 times in the Bible in whole or in part. So I'm gonna put this up on the screen. Now this is my translation, which that I call the CBT, Charlie Boyd translation. And uh, I had somebody, somebody call the church uh, and ask uh, Katie Malone, my assistant, she said, he said, what is this, where can I get this CBT? <laughs> well, <laughs> well you, you get it by coming to church on Sunday morning. But anyway, <laughs> but um, verse six, and he, Yahweh, passed in front of Moses proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness, maintaining loyal love to thousands and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin, but he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Visiting the sins of the fathers on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Now, there's a little bit of tension in the room right now, like, right? Because, you know, our hearts were warmed by the first part of that passage. We love how God is a God of compassion and, and, grace, and he's gracious and he's patient and he's loving and he's faithful and he's forgiving and he's slow to anger, it makes us feel all warm and fuzzy inside, and rightfully so. But then the passage ends with this thing about punishment where God says, I am a compassionate and gracious and patient and loving, faithful, forgiving, and slow to anger God, but know this, I'm also a God who will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And we're like, ooh, I don't know if I like that or not. That's pretty scary. Again, most of us think that God is either one or the other, or if he's both and one trumps the other, or something like that. It's kind of confusing, because the question is, how do you relate to a God who you think is loving most of the time, but then you're like worried that if you mess up, then he will punish you, and maybe your children and grandchildren because of your sin? We see the problem. How do we make sense of this? Well, first of all, you have to understand that this passage has a larger context. This passage is set in a much larger story. It's, uh, it comes after something uh, terrible happens among God's people and God reveals himself to Moses based on what has happened. This is not some abstract, disconnected theological statement about what God is like. No, this comes right, in, right smack in the middle of a really important story. A really important story. So if you look back in your Bible to Exodus 32, if you just look at the chapter title, 
What is this chapter about? The golden calf, right. If you don't know the story, it's a very important story in the plot line of the Bible so far. And I'm going to have to summarize the story or we won't understand how God's merciful love and his severe justice establish each other. Now, by a sheer act of mercy and grace, Yahweh has delivered the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. They've been there for 400 years, and God has shown himself faithful to the promises he made to Abraham to bless his descendants and the children of Israel. God's brought them out of Egypt, and he's brought them to the foot of a mountain. What is the mountain's name? Mount Sinai, right. And Yahweh appears to, the, uh, to Israel personally in the form of this huge dark cloud with thunder and lightning, and that cloud settles on the top of, a, of the mountain of Mount Sinai for a long time. And he reveals himself to uh, his people. He says, I am Yahweh, you are my people, I rescued you, I have loved you, and I'm committing myself to you through a covenant that cannot be broken. Don't go after other gods. Don't try to represent me with some image or idol and try to worship me the way other nations worship me or even your forefathers worship me. Now, this, th that's the first thing that Yahweh tells them to do. And what's the first thing they do? Well, Moses climbs up Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments on stone tablets. Forty days go by. The cloud and the thunderstorm are still hanging on top of the mountain. What do they do? They do exactly what Yahweh told them not to do. They make a golden calf idol. I mean, how do you worship a thunderstorm? What's that all about? You need, you need something more tangible and less scary, like a little calf. And, and so they, 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 they make this golden calf idol to worship as the image of Yahweh. It, God said, don't make any graven images. They do exactly what God told them not to do, but that's not all. They throw a big party. And if you read the story, it says they eat and drink. In other words, they eat all this food and they get hammered. And that's not all. Exodus 32, 6 says, the people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. Mm. A translator's being polite. They did not rise up to play kickball. They make a calf idol. They have a big party. Worshiping the calf is, is supposed to be worshiping a, 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 an image of Yahweh. They eat, they get plastered, and they have sex. That's what's happening here. Now, where would they get the idea that that is the way they should be worshiping a deity? I mean, okay, so where have they been? Well, they've been in Egypt for 400 years. And for those 400 years, they've not been worshiping Yahweh exclusively. Exclusively. They don't really know Yahweh. So he's revealing himself to them because they don't know God. Not like Abraham did 400 years earlier. And so the tragedy of this story is that Yahweh has revealed himself to them as a compassionate and gracious and faithful God, and the first time they actually try to worship him, they go about worshiping him as if he's just another Egyptian or Canaanite deity. Now, how did, the, how did people who didn't know God worship their, their gods? They did it through ritual meals and ritual sex. So the first thing they do is the very thing God told them not to do, and God is angry. And he says he's going to punish them, wipe them out, and start over again with Moses. But Moses intercedes for the people, and Yahweh relents. But the scripture does say that there were 3,000 of them who took part in this rebellious, God-dishonoring party, and Yahweh wipes them out. So Yahweh forgives and doesn't sever his covenant with the nation as a whole, but at the same time, for those Israelites who were like, we don't care what you say, we're going to do what we want to anyway, uh, they face the music, and they perish. It, that's the story. Now let's go back to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Uh, this list, as I said, this list of Yahweh's attributes is not just some random, abstract, theological list of attributes of God. No, this is, this is God 
summarizing and revealing how he just acted in the story. He's Yahweh, Yahweh. He's compassionate. He's, he has emotional concern for the well-being of his people. And he's deeply hurt when his people uh, totally disregard what he's told them to do for their own good and for the good of future generations. He's merciful and gracious, giving people something they don't deserve. He's faithful. He keeps covenant with them. He's slow to anger, which means he, it doesn't mean he never gets angry. It means he can hold his anger. And he's been holding his anger for a long time because this isn't the first time that Israel's been a total jerk to Yahweh. You just read chapter 16 and other incidents, you see how the people of Israel were so dishonoring God and, 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 and grumbling in all kinds of incidents along the way from, uh, from Egypt on their way to the promised land. So yeah, he's, he's slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, but then verse seven is also a summary of what just happened in the story. Again, this is my main point. So I'll put verse seven back up on the screen again. This is Yahweh telling people what he's really like, what he has just demonstrated, had to demonstrate. So Yahweh, verse seven, maintains love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, but he by no means will leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the sins of the fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Now, you notice how I put the word generations in red there. I did that because the word generations is not actually in the Hebrew text. That's something the translators have supplied for us. Literally, it should read, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the sins of the fathers on the children and grandchildren to the threes and fours. Now, he doesn't mean three-year-olds and four-year-olds. All right, that sounds weird. Like, but I want you to notice something, though, Notice how the passage is bookended with numbers. He maintains covenant love to thousands, but he'll visit the sins of fathers to the threes and fours. Something very important going on here. The two are related. Now, this could certainly be referring to generations. I'm not saying that's wrong, but there's something more going on here that's gonna help us understand what he means when he talks about sins being... Sins of the Father is being visited on future generations. Verse 7 is a kind of, has a kind of poetic structure to it, a poetic form that's called a chiasm. And a chiasm or a chiasm shows up all through the Bible, especially in the Old Testament and especially in Hebrew literature. Chiasms help us see how each part of the passage corresponds to other parts of the passage. So we see here that uh, Yahweh, he keeps loyal love for thousands, he forgives sin, now, but look at the middle of this, yet punishing the guilty. How does he do that? Visiting the father's sins on children and grandchildren upon the threes and fours. So you see how this breaks down. Now my only point right here, and we're gonna unpack this, the only point right here, or the one basic observation I wanna make, and this is so powerful, is that verse seven, helps us see how God's love and mercy run in tandem with God's justice and judgment. Verse seven is a powerful statement about how God's love relates to his justice and his justice relates to his love. Uh, so let's, uh, I mean, how, how, it helps us understand how God is both a God of love and mercy and a God of justice and judgment. Now let's break it down. Yahweh keeps his covenant love for thousands. Now think about this. If this was generations, it would be like 40,000 years. Now this is poetry. So this is like a metaphor for forever. God keeps his loyal love forever, for all eternity. Yahweh will keep his covenant with his people forever. He's permanently committed to them. But somehow, that doesn't mean he will excuse or not deal with the sin of individuals or families or even generations. So if you put these two things on a scale and you have thousands on one side and threes and fours on the other side, how's the scale gonna tip? Yeah, it's gonna tip in, 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 uh, towards uh, God's love and, and, and mercy. So what's my point? 
If your primary way of thinking about God is always, that he's always out to get you, always ready to hit the red button and take you out, that's a distortion. His loyal love outweighs, far outweighs his wrath. He leans towards mercy rather than judgment. Jesus, uh, James, Jesus' half-brother, author of the book that bears his name, he puts it this way in chapter 2, verse 13. He says, mercy triumphs over judgment. God leans towards mercy, which you see in the story that I just walked you through. If he wasn't like this, he would have ditched Israel and started over with Moses, but he didn't do that. He was committed to the covenant that he made with Abraham. He's committed to covenant love for thousands, forever. Now, there is a great debate over the number of men and women and children who God delivered from slavery, and Scripture says that the number was 600,000 men, could be well over two million people. Either way, God's covenant love was steadfast to thousands, as in 600 one-thousands. And the 3,000 who thumbed their nose at Yahweh were punished. Put those numbers in the scale, how does it tip? It tips towards God's love and mercy. Yeah, yeah, see, actually, God's justice is a function of his love. If he loves, he has to put an end to evil. And he has to put an end to evil that is perpetuated from generation to generation. God's justice then is a reaction to the injustices humans uh, commit when, when we disregard what he's told us to do for our own good. Because he loves us, he's warned us. God's love, God's warnings are his love. Now, so, okay, okay, okay. So what about the point of visiting sins on fathers and on children what is, and grandchildren? What does that mean? Okay, stay with me. A very common way of reading and understanding the last sentence of verse 7 goes something like this. So you got Grandpa John here, and he's a bad guy, immoral man, whatever. He's got issues, and he completely gives in to those issues, you know, he's slept around on grandma, he's been unfaithful to grandma, he's abused alcohol, given in to the addiction, and he was abusive to himself and others. So here's Grandpa John. And then you got two generations later or so, you got grandson Jimmy. Now grandson Jimmy is not acting like his grandfather, but the, in misinterpretation of this passage is that apparently God is going to visit on him the sins of his grandpa even though he doesn't commit those sins. You with me? Now, uh, um, that's how some people misunderstand this. God holds future generation could be for one man's Bad behavior or sin. And you may have grown up in a religious tradition where this idea is often called a generational curse or something like that, where God's disfavor kind of hangs over a family because of something someone did in the past. And I'm telling you that that idea has no grounding in Scripture. I believe it's deeply damaging and dangerous. It's, it's an idea that hurts people. And it hurts God because we're saying things about him that are are not true. They're actually not true of how he deals with his people. But you say, "I, I can hear you. I mean, you don't have to shout. But Charlie, isn't that what it says? It sure sounds like what it says. No, that's not what it says. Here's why. There are other passages of scripture in the Bible that talk about the exact same question of how Yahweh deals with generations of people who turn from him, and those passages say the exact opposite of what I just said. The exact opposite. Deuteronomy 24. Again, this is Yahweh speaking. He says, parents are not to be put to death for their children's sins, or children put to death for their parents' sins. Each will die for his own sin. And Deuteronomy 24 is set in a context where Moses is helping establish justice in Israel. They're setting up a just judicial system in Israel. Everyone pays for their own sins, not somebody else's. Ezekiel chapter 18, again, Yahweh speaking. 
He says, children will not suffer for the iniquity of their parents, nor parents suffer for the iniquity of their children. The righteousness of the righteous, righteous will be their own, and the wickedness of the wicked will be their own. And Yahweh says this in the context where you have a bunch of Israelites sitting in exile in Babylon, and they're going, how did we get here? Oh, I know how we got here, because our parents were such bad, wicked, rebellious sinners. And Ezekiel comes along, and he says, no, 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 no. You guys are just as dysfunctional as they were. You're just not owning it. That's what he's saying here. Yahweh holds each generation accountable for its own sin. Twice in Ezekiel 18, Yahweh says, the soul who sins will die. So it can't be that Yahweh, what Yahweh says here about himself in Exodus 34, 7, means he'll visit some generational curse on a family because of someone's past sins. You see in this. So what does verse 7 mean? All right, let's go back to verse 7. I take it that the most likely understanding of what Yahweh is saying here comes from understanding the phrase, the threes and fours. Now, think. There are a couple of Proverbs in the book of Proverbs where the poet says something like this. There are three things in the world that amaze me, four that I just don't understand. You read these Proverbs before? They're, in, uh, they're pretty much all in chapter 30. A whole bunch of them. He says something like, there are three things that are really bad in the world and four things that are even worse. It's a Hebrew saying. It's, it's, a, it's an idiom. It's a turn of a phrase. There are three, even four. So what's it mean? Hold on, hold on, say it with me. The prophet Amos, Amos chapter one, he is talking about and he's listing all the horrible things that Israel and the nations are doing and he begins, it's the, the whole chapter is like this. He begins every one of his accusations like this. For three sins of Israel, even four, I'm gonna hold them accountable. I will punish them. For three sins, even four, Damascus, Gaza. He goes right through this list. Whole chapter, for three, even four. And you're like, wait, 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 which is it? Is it three or four? No, 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 you're missing the point. This is, this is an idiom. Threes and fours is an idiom, which means... Which means, whatever number of generations that did wrong, Yahweh will hold them accountable for their sin. And I think that's exactly what it means right here in Exodus 34. In other words, Yahweh is eternally committed to love and forgive those who turn to him in repentance and faith. However, Yahweh will visit his justice on whatever number of generations he needs to in order to hold people accountable for their sin. He will visit his justice on whatever number of generations that he needs to in order to hold people accountable for their sin. Now, think, who is Yahweh holding accountable? He's holding people accountable for the sins of the fathers that they are perpetuating. Can you think of a story where you have children perpetuating the sins of their parents? Oh, right, yeah, like the story we just read, like what happened here with the golden calf catastrophe in Exodus 32. It's a story that th these words are summarizing. In other words, you have to read these words in light of the larger story, and the story is about the current generation at the foot of Mount Sinai, they are perpetuating the sins of their parents and their grandparents. How so? In how they worship Yahweh in the same way that some of their ancestors worship Yahweh, mixing Yahweh worship with idol worship. The way they, ought, the way they worship the gods of, of Egypt, ritual meals, ritual sex in ways that Yahweh says are sinful and dis, de, dehumanizing and dishonoring to him. That's exactly what Yahweh is saying here. In other words, Yahweh keeps his covenant for thousands, forgiving them, yet he will not do so at the expense of his justice. He will bring his justice on however many generations continue to perpetuate the destructive behaviors of their fathers, and he will do so until they repent and turn to Yahweh, committing themselves to keep Yahweh's commandments. And if they don't turn and repent, they perish. So, so this is about Grandpa John and Grandson Jimmy, 
but it's a grandson, Jimmy, who looked at Grandpa John, and Jimmy's doing the exact, very same exact kinds of things his grandfather did. So Yahweh holds each one of them, each of us, each of generation accountable for our own sinful choices, regardless, listen, regardless of the influences that might give us a disposition to act in a certain way. It's not about, it's about some generational curse linked to some ancestors past sin. This is about generational sin. Like if one generation's sin is perpetuated in successive generations, then God will hold each generation, whatever number of generations responsible for their sin. Now listen, some of us, maybe a good number of us, grew up in dysfunctional families, right? Like, well, what's new? But that can never be an excuse. You may have grown up with the worst of the worst kind of parents, and I know that's true of, of some of you because I spent lots of hours over cups of coffee talking with people about these kinds of things. And, and I'm, I'm sorry that, hap that happened to you. But at the end of the day, as God's image-bearing adult, before God, you are responsible for your own decisions. Your parents don't make your decisions for you. Now, yes, you do have a unique set of challenges that you face based on your family of origin. But ultimately, it's your choice as to whether or not you're going to perpetuate the sins of your parents. Or are you going to find freedom and let Yahweh heal you and change you? And that may require that you get the help of a trained biblical counselor to help you with that. And we can help you with that because we not only have a, a, a class called Regen for uh, marriage, we have a class called, um, I mean, Reengage. We have a class called Regen that's helped hundreds of people find freedom from all kinds of past and present issues that have held them prisoner. And Regen is gonna start in October, and if you're interested in that class, um, I encourage you to talk with Trenton Stokes, who did a great job teaching us about the glory of God last week. But talk to Trenton and go online, get the details. God's justice, <clears throat> his judgment, his wrath, means that he will do whatever is necessary to put a stop to human evil. He holds people responsible for their actions. And right now, this world continues to be in rebellion against its creator, and the vast majority of inhabitants on planet Earth have refused to acknowledge God as God, or they worship distortions of the one true and living God. And right now, we see God being slow to anger. Ezekiel 18 says, God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, because the wicked, if they die, they can't repent. And the New Testament says that God doesn't want anybody to repent, but all to, uh, anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance and faith in Christ. But there's a, a coming day in the future, a judgment day, and on that day, God is gonna set right all this wrong with this world, and those who have thumbed their noses at God will have to face the music. And on that day, when God sets right all this wrong in the world, he'll make all things new, and true justice will be established in all the earth as a reflection of how, God, how good God really is. And you want that, right? I mean, yes, absolutely, we want God to set right all this wrong in this world. I mean, we wish he would do it now. But the only reason he's not doing it now is he's slow to anger, and he's leaving time for more people to repent. Okay, so that's God's self-revelation, self-description in the Old Testament. And I want to show you two passages in the New Testament that say the very same thing in a little bit different way. That God's love and mercy are directly connected to his justice and judgment. That God's love and mercy runs in tandem with his justice and judgment. The New Testament talks about the very same tension. How can God be a loving and merciful God and a God of justice and judgment at the same time. New Testament answers that question clearly. We're gonna look at a familiar passage, so familiar 
as you probably never connected it to this Old Testament description of God found here in Exodus 34. But uh, I'll see if you recognize this. John chapter three, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How many of you have heard that before? I hope everybody in here raises their hand. Yeah, of course. John 3.16 is one of the best known, most quoted verses in the Bible. But because it's so familiar, because we've heard it so many times, all too often we just read right over it and don't even think about it. But here's the question. Why would anybody be in danger of perishing if God so loved the world? Why would anybody be in danger of perishing if God is a God of love? And the answer is... He is a loving God. He loves this world that's in rebellion against him. He is slow to anger, still leaving time for people to repent and turn to him. But he's also set a day in the future where he will put an end to this rebellion. And he will punish all all those who have lived their lives in rebellion against him. He'll set right all that's wrong. And right now. This rebellious world stands under the judgment of God. Now, let's go back, and I want to show you John 3, 16 in its larger context, because this is going to help us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not judged, but whoever does not believe is judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This is Jesus speaking. He makes it clear that God, because he does love us, Even in our wickedness and rebellion and sin, he loves us and he sent his son to save us from the coming judgment. When you talk about being saved, do you know what that means? It means saved from the coming judgment. And he's come to make us right with God by forgiving our sin and giving us eternal life so that we don't come under that judgment. But he will not let sin go unpunished. You see that, love, mercy, justice, judgment. He will not let sin go unpunished, but whoever believes in him is not judged, is not punished. How is that possible? Because on the cross, Jesus took on himself, into himself, all our sin. He took on himself the judgment for our sin, the punishment for our sin, so that, verse 18 again, Whoever believes in him is not judged, but whoever does not believe is judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And then at the end of this chapter, John summarizes what Jesus has said, and John says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever rejects the Son does not see the life, but the wrath of God the judgment of God remains on him. John is saying that when Jesus came the first time, he did not come to bring judgment upon the world. The world stands under the judgment of God, but Jesus didn't come to execute that judgment. He came to be executed, to save the world. That is through dying on the cross for our sins and rising from the dead, he saves all of those who put their faith in him He saves them from God's coming judgment. So so Jesus didn't come the first time to judge, but the second time he comes, and he is coming back, the second time he comes, he's gonna come as judge. And John chapter five makes this abundantly clear. So take your Bible and turn to John chapter five, verse 22. John 5, 22, this is Jesus speaking. I'm also, all these are on the screen this morning, but here's Jesus speaking. Speaking, for the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Now, whoever does not honor the Son doesn't honor the Father who sent him. Now, look at this. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He who does not, and he does not come into judgment. He doesn't come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, hour is coming. It's here right now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear him will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he's granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given, just, I'm gonna put this in Jesus' words, in his, uh, using personal pronouns. He has uh, given, or, let's see, I lost my plate here. He has given me authority to execute judgment because I am the son of man. Do not be surprised at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear my voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So here's Jesus. He's talking about his second coming, and he's talking about final judgment. Now listen, don't give me all that stuff about God being an angry, judging God in the Old Testament, but a loving, merciful God in the New Testament. No, this is Jesus telling you what God is really like. This is Jesus telling you what he is really like. And Jesus tells us in no uncertain terms, because God loves this world, he sent Jesus the first time to save us from our sin and God's judgment, to make a way for people to not come under the coming judgment of God. And Jesus says, if you put your faith in me to forgive your sins and give you a brand new life with God that starts now and goes on forever, you will not come, out of, uh, come under that judgment, but you will pass from death into life. God is loving. He sent his son to be judged on our, on our behalf. Jesus is loving. He went to the cross for us to take God's judgment onto, into himself on the cross. And when you place your faith in Christ, God gives you eternal life, and you will not be judged by Judge Jesus on the final day. Why not? Because that judgment of our injustices, Jesus has already paid for that. Jesus is the judge who was judged in our place, so we would not come under judgment. And that is good news. That is really good news. That's the gospel of grace, that's the gospel of grace. Now, two quick points in, in closing. Sometimes I think when uh, believers talk about this whole thing of God and, and Christ and people, we, we, we kind of talk in a way that if we're not careful, we can misrepresent uh, who God is. Uh, in other words, uh, here's God uh, up there and there's people down here and people are sinful, God is holy and righteous, and so God reacts to our unrighteousness, and this is where the wrath of God comes in. So some people, when they start talking about this, it's almost like they talk about God as a kind of a mean God, perpetually angry. He can't wait to zap us. His primary attribute is that he's angry. But then God sends this good person, Christ, and Christ is the Savior. He's the good guy, and so Christ is between us and God. Mean God, merciful Savior. Now, I'm putting this in kind of hyper language so you can see how wrong this is. But God's really angry. He can't wait to bring judgment crashing down on people. So people need to be saved from God. So he sends Jesus, and Jesus is our Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the rescuer. He's the good guy. Now, you see how wrong I'm presenting this. But how, why is it wrong? Because I'm separating God and Jesus, and that's wrong. That's wrong. It's not... It's not what the New Testament teaches, or the Old Testament teaches for that matter. It's wrong. The New Testament teaches that God and Christ are the same. People struggle with the, the father sends his son to die. Like, and then it's like, like a, a father would send his little child to be massacred? Oh, how, could, how can you believe in a guy? Like, no, no, no. It's God in Christ. He's not two separate people. It's God in Christ died for our sins. Both willing parties. Now, uh, uh, so, so Jesus dies on the cross. 
It's the work of God in Christ. I'm just trying to correct a common misunderstanding. A very common distortion of what God is like and what Jesus is like. And sometimes we talk about God like he's mean, like he's out to get us, and that's wrong. Now, he's loving and just. Look at how the Apostle Paul puts it together in 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Paul says, all of this is from God. The whole thing about salvation is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was, in, in, uh, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Look at this. Not counting people's sins against them. So, so when you put your faith and trust in Christ, God doesn't count your sins against you anymore. Because of what God the Son has done for us, God doesn't count your sins against you. That's good news. It's really good news. It's the gospel of grace. Now let me summarize this all in a, with a graphic. This is leading to my point number two. As we've seen in Exodus 34 and John 3 and John 5, God is a God of love and mercy and he's a God of justice and judgment. He's both at the same time and the scriptures teach us that these two attributes of God come together and establish each other on the cross. But we've also seen that all who put their faith in Jesus as the one sent by God to save us from the coming judgment, they come out from under the judgment of God and all who are in Christ, listen, they not only escape the judgment of the final day, but in the here and now, Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation to anyone who's inside the circle, anyone who is in Christ. No condemnation, not now, not on the final day. And that is good news. That's really good news. That's the gospel of grace. But if you're on the outside of the circle, if you reject Christ and his offer to save you from the coming judgment of God, what, what, did, what did John say at the end of John 3? You remain under the judgment of God. Now, some of you are listening to this. You've, you've heard all this before, or you've heard something like it before. You've seen John 3.16 plastered on, in, in the stands uh, uh, watching sports on TV. Problem is, you never responded to it. You've heard it, you know it, you're familiar with it, but you never really have responded to it. Never have put your faith in Christ for whatever reason. And, and I'm, I'm gonna say this as lovingly and kindly as I can say it, but I gotta tell you the truth. You're in danger of perishing. You're in danger of perishing. If I had a sign, or if I had a light up here, It'd be a warning light flashing, warning, warning, warning. God's warnings are acts of his love. Some people say, uh, you know, divorce, divorce is the worst thing that can happen to you. And it is devastating, had it happened in my family. It is devastating. Some people say cancer, boy, if you get pancreatic cancer, that's the worst thing that could happen to you. And that is a really bad, awful thing. Some people say if you lose your children in a car accident, that's the absolute worst thing that can happen. I can't imagine anything worse than that. Those are terrible, awful, really bad things. But that's not the worst thing that can happen to you. The worst thing that can happen is to stay outside the circle, to reject Christ, remain under God's judgment, and to perish. That's the worst thing. To be separated from God forever. And what you need to do for the love of God is to place your faith in Christ. The one who hears, Jesus says, the one who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life. And that one will not be judged. You cross from death to life. Now, here's the truth of the matter. People who do research on these kinds of things have found that the longer people wait... The longer they hang around the church service, come to a place like this and they hear what's familiar, but they never respond, the longer that goes on, the chances are they'll never respond. It's just too familiar. You don't know what's gonna happen to you today or tomorrow, 
But if you die without Christ, you will perish. Because, yes, God is a God of love. He is compassionate and gracious and kind and slow to anger. He overflows with loving kindness and faithfulness. And that's why he sent Jesus into the world. Because he loves us. He's done something for us to where we don't have to remain under God's judgment. But he's also, though, a God of justice, and he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And I plead with you, put your faith in Christ today. Put In the privacy of your own heart, put your faith in Jesus today. All you have to do is say, God, I admit that, you have, that I have lived my life apart from you. I admit I've sinned and come short of the person you want me to be. And then tell him you're putting your faith in Jesus. Tell him you're trusting Jesus to forgive your sins and give you eternal life, just like Jesus promised he would. Tell him now. You don't have to come forward. You don't have to, do, you don't have to bow your head. I can do, make that transfer of trust to Jesus in your heart. And if you do, and you want to talk with someone, at the end of the service, we have a little prayer station over there, and there'll be some people over there, and they can talk with you, and they can pray with you about this. So, Christian, here is your God. Worship him and live with him every single day in line with what he's really like. And he is loving and merciful, and he's just, and he will execute judgment. He's both. I'm so glad we're coming to the Lord's table today because, uh, well, and by the way, if, if you haven't, if you didn't pick one of these up on the way in, this is our communion bread and cup, okay? So feel free, starting now or through the song that we're gonna sing afterwards, feel free to pick one of these up. Everyone who's put their faith and trust in Christ is welcome to partake with us today. But we're coming to the Lord's table. I'm so glad about it because the elements of communion are visible, are a visible, tangible way to celebrate what God has done for us in Christ. Because you see, on the very same night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus had a final meal with his disciples, and during that meal, he took the common elements of the Passover supper, and he gave them new meaning. Now, the Passover meal goes all the way back to God's graciously delivering the children of Israel from Egypt that I talked about earlier. After 400 years, God was judging Pharaoh and the Egyptians for the harsh treatment that they had inflicted on his people as slaves in Egypt, and Moses has delivered God's message to Pharaoh, let my people go, and nine awful plagues ravaged the Egyptian people. God meant business. Pharaoh had resisted, and so there was one final plague coming. There would be a night when the angel of God would go throughout Egypt, and God's judgment would fall. And, he, and, and the angel would take the life of all the firstborn sons of the Egyptian households. As protection from God's judgment, the Israelites were told to kill a lamb and to brush its blood over the doorpost of the homes. And in that way, when the death angel would come, he would pass over the Israelites and they would escape judgment. The terrible thing did happen, and even Pharaoh's firstborn son was taken. And fi Pharaoh finally relented and let God's people go. And the Jews have been celebrating that Passover night just before the exodus out of Egypt for centuries. They still do it to this day. Jesus was about to die on the cross. His body would be broken, his blood shed, so that all who believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So he took the bread from the table and he said, this bread represents my body broken for you. He, this bread represents what I'm about to suffer for you. What was he suffering? The crushing weight of God's judgment. And he was going to take that onto himself. 
so we wouldn't have to. And he says, whenever you eat this bread, remember me. Then he said at the end of the meal, he took the cup and he said, this cup represents my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This cup represents my death, the payment for your sins. So do you see the bread in the cup, his body and blood, his suffering and death, the judge, judge for you, so you wouldn't be judged. And so as you take the bread and cup today in just a few moments after the, after the next song, remember the significance of what Jesus did for you. Because of Jesus, we have been delivered from slavery to sin. Because of Jesus, we have escaped the coming judgment of God, and that is good news. That's really good news. That's the gospel of grace.